Uh, first, I will start with uh, something that most of you might have already seen uh, in October of uh, last year. In Odessa, uh, a statue of Lenin was uh, converted into Dark Vader. And this made to the international headlines. However, few knew that this was connected to the government's recently passed legislation about uh, decommunization. Although Odessa is known for its creativity and humor, uh, most of the cities now are required that they should remove the Lenin statues. And by 91, Ukraine had around 5,000 Lenin statues. By the uh, end of Maidan events, uh, all 1,300 of them were taken down. And also, you might remember, not really good screen, but you might remember on Khrushchev at the beginning of the Ukraine Maidan events, uh, you had young Ukrainians who tried to put down another Lenin statue, uh, and the government-controlled Berkut forces were we're trying to defend this statue from the protesters, and this event, in a way, put two groups, government that defended Lenin and the young Ukrainians who wanted to uh, take him down on opposite sides of the history. Uh, th this event in Ukraine instigated Leninopat, this is where my title comes from, or <laughs> Lenin of, Len fall of Lenins across mm -hmm. the Ukraine. Um, and as one of my um, respondents in interviews said, this was in a way, a declaration that uh, Ukraine, as a former Soviet Union um, Republic, was once and for all getting out of Moscow's grasp. So, uh, uh, you can see half of my slides, but uh, my structure of the presentations uh, will start with uh, intro. Uh, we'll talk about research question, research methods, theoretical framework, and move to the main part of the paper, which includes the first part, where I will talk about the identity in Ukraine after Maidan, and the communization package of laws as regarded by Ukrainians themselves, and other, the, what factors play a role. First, we'll, I will discuss Russia, Russia factor, and then Donbas uh, as hopelessly Sovietized, as regarded by many, and then move uh, towards the conclusions. Uh, so, first of all, can we somehow? No, no, it's, it's, it's a problem with the uh, So, uh, what my research question is, why did the Ukrainian government decide to undertake the decommunization process after the Maidan? Why have not seen we, in past 25 years similar process to emerge? What, whether it's related to the identity change or not, and what are the internal and external factors that led the Ukrainian government revisit, if you would like, its Soviet past? Uh, and the research methods I've used are my interviews and my fieldwork in Ukraine, uh, consisted of, consisting of two parts, interviews with the authors of the legislation, with the members of the parliament, civil society representatives, journalists uh, in Kiev and in Lviv, uh, and observations. I traveled to uh, Slavyansk, Artyomsk, Eastern, in Eastern Ukraine, went to all the way to Lviv, and also very Western Ukraine, Mukacheva, and so on, went to the museums, the pre famous Blotsko prison that has been prison under different governments throughout the Ukrainian history. Um, and these are, uh, this is where my research mainly comes from. Of course, I'm also looking at uh, some of the main speeches that Poroshenko has made after uh, Maidan, and uh, among them, the literature that exists on the top. Uh, so, theoretical framework. <laughs> uh, uh, my theoretical framework is uh, critical junctures theory. I've previously as well used this uh, sometimes uh, when I was talking about Georgia in similar context, but what critical junctures theory means, it's a, it's a period in a, a development of a country's political past when a, a certain option from the range of alternatives is selected and when a crisis in, in a crisis situation so to say it's a perceived crisis situation that results in redirection of the political path uh, and uh, this critical juncture theory has three main pillars uh, that I'm expanding in my paper first this is symbolism or how the government use the symbols and myths and try to create new discourse and narrative and secondly it relates to the identity space uh, or to say whether the government is able to actually uh, enforce the discourse, whether uh, in identity space there is rejection of the dominant res uh, response, and uh, thirdly, it relates to uh, state technologies, or this very technological term in a way, I think some of the math scientists also wrote this theory, so uh, um, not very uh, social science oriented, but it means the uh, ability of the government to actually implement its discourse in practice. 
uh, and uh, two, uh, yeah. So I'm discussing Maidan as a critical juncture in uh, in discourse development of Ukraine, and when the new elite of Ukraine thought to uh, to come up with new ideas uh, or channel the demands of Maidan. Uh, Although the theory also suggests that critical junctures can be a missed opportunity rather than uh, leading to a, a reorientation of the political uh, future or polit uh, political path. Um, so first, uh, I am discussing in my paper first part uh, regards to Maidan, ground zero. So uh, we had Maidan events, we 113 people died who are now regarded as heavenly hundred and the Ukrainian identity that is uh, no one can say that it's already, you know, it, it completed. However, it's in the process of uh, identifying Maidan as sacrifice, as, as a catharsis that Ukraine went through, and uh, there is need of rest, change in the rules of games and the emergence of new Ukraine, so to say. Uh, when Poroshenko first made his speech, uh, oh, well, he said, uh, his inauguration speech, he said, oh, the country has changed, the people have changed, now it's time of the government to deliver change. Uh, his uh, official motto during the campaign was to live new way, thus trying to uh, channel the uh, uh, channel uh, the demands of Maidan. Uh, and what we have seen throughout this period, and I'm looking at uh, various polls, among them uh, uh, one uh, done by the International Research Institute, Ukrainian International Institute of Research, that says that in the beginning of Maidan, 88% of Ukrainians approved, had positive view of Russian. By May of 2015, only 30% uh, viewed Russia as uh, uh, positively. And same time, uh, in support for, for the European integration from 30% grew all the way to 55%. Uh, thus, we have seen uh, in, in that sense uh, reorientation of uh, the Ukrainian public, or and that's understandable given uh, given the recent events when it comes to the war on Donbas. Uh, and when uh, when I'm talking about this, I'm trying also to explain that Ukrainians. I mean, this has been many many times said, but uh, Ukrainians on Maidan stood not only for uh, European integration, uh, but as some Milan Kundera put it very well, very. Well, when talking about Hungarians and Czechs, that the idea of West and Europe for Hungarians and Czechs is about higher degree of democracy and higher degree of freedom rather than uh, the European integration per se. So this is how I'm looking at uh, what demands came out of Maidan and what is now the Ukrainian government trying to channel. Uh, second part, um, and finally getting there, is the decommunization package. Decommunization package is I mean, this uh, set of laws and there are four laws is, uh, by themselves. Um, Ukrainians regarded it as decommunization package. However, it can be actually argued whether it's decommunization package. Obviously, social scientists, as most of the cases, don't have one accepted uh, idea of what decommunization means. Uh, for me, I uh, related it um, relate of, uh, on some other works, and it, it's defined it for my paper as like denazification, a mental, cultural, psychological process, as much as political, economic, and legal one. So if we look at the decommunization package, or what Ukraine calls decommunization package, we can say that Ukrainian uh, package replies to only psychological and cultural, however, does not really speak about political, economic, and legal. Uh, what I mean by this, it does not include the illustration that we have seen in uh, Central Eastern Europe. Um, and as uh, most of you probably know, Eastern uh, Gem Germany was the pioneer of the decommunization, then uh, peasant illustration, then followed by Czechoslovakia. Then uh, we has we saw in uh, in Hungary, Poland, uh, also prohibition of the uh, communist symbols. And what we see now in uh, Ukraine's case, law is not groundbreaking in terms of. Uh, legal side of it. Uh, however, includes parts that we have not seen in Central Eastern Europe. So it first talks about bringing up the communist and Nazi um, socialist regimes on the same level. So regarding, and it includes very obscure part where it regards 70 years of Soviet rule uh, having criminal nature, and it prohibits the denial of denying that the Soviet Union had the uh, criminal nature. Uh, however, there are no uh, provisions in law that uh, that say what should be done in case in case someone denies this and in Ukraine there are many who deny would deny that the Soviet Union had a criminal nature for 70 years of uh, period second part of the law is uh, opening archives that we have seen in, uh, in Hungary in other parts of 
uh, of satellite states. Uh, and opening of archives has been largely accepted, not criticized, uh, however related also to certain difficulties given that most of the archives are already moved to Russia. Now they are uh, you know, lost archives in case of Donbas. Uh, some have been just burned. Uh, some have been moved to again to Moscow. Uh, and the another part uh, of law has, uh, that is, uh, also regards to the uh, Second World War and names it the Second World War rather than Great Patriotic War and uh, sets the dates from 39 to 45 instead of 241 to 45. And uh, most controversial part of the decommunization package is the force part of the law which, uh, which comm commemorates freedom fighters for Ukrainians' independence. So, and it also, like in mean, previous case of the criminal nature of the co Soviet Union, uh, also prohibits denial the role of the freedom fighters uh, in Ukrainian history. And uh, specifically, this part of the law caused much of international um, attention, much of international um, uh, discussion, and uh, 70 scholars send a letter to uh, President Poroshenko ahead of uh, signing the bill into law that this was registered in the history and he, uh, he was politicizing historical memory and attacking something very fundamental for researchers, pursuit of truth. However, the, the, the package was anyways passed uh, and now implementation is, uh, is in question. Uh, another criticism that I have to mention, m less important however, is the symbols and rename in the streets. Uh, but uh, the, the, for the population, probably the most important because it, they have to pay from their you know, budget for, for this and it has been calculated that it, would, it will require, actually in foreign, policy in foreign policy magazine I saw 1 billion point three US dollars and I was thinking that was a wrong number but maybe even not wrong number. Um, uh, but uh, uh, to rename all, because Ukraine has around southern cities and Eight thousand of villages to rename. Uh, around eight thousand villages to rename. Poroshenko owns the company that's going to print the street signs. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Um, I can't say anything about that. Um, however, uh, uh, however, the part uh, about uh, most visible part, and then we can also see nihilism towards the law from the population because, for example, the residents of Dnipropetrovsk decided that they would rather keep Dnipropetrovsk which is named by, after Petrovsk, who was uh, one of the apparatchiks of the Soviet um, Party, you, Communist Party, uh, and residents of Dnepro Petrovsk, I said it three times, I deserve a credit, uh, <laughs> this, uh, decided that let's keep Dnepro Petrovsk, but just say that we, um, we mean uh, St. Peter, <laughs> not Petrovsk. <laughs> uh, and that's, that has been the uh, last suggestion. Uh, so, uh, so to say what I'm trying to say about when I discuss the communication package of, uh, of the communication package, I mean that uh, in reality it does not offer substantial change. Uh, the only reason why uh, the government would, uh, would actually pass the laws is uh, that they need to deliver uh, on promises they have made and given that they are fighting war on Donbas, they are revisiting the nationalist rhetoric. These ideas are there. Uh, it's not. It's not really a secret that we have Western Ukrainians uh, do glorify the freedom fighters of Ukraine, uh, and specifically when I mean freedom fighters, uh, I'm talking about UPA and ON. I should not miss this, given the, uh, their role in uh, pogroms against Jews and Poles, uh, and uh, and their. Uh, and that's, that's, that is not, and I will talk later, that is not shared across the population. This is a Western Ukrainian idea that the, is, uh, that the Poroshenko government has taken up as a national idea. And in that sense, uh, next thing I would, uh, I'm discussing in my paper is what factor does Russia play here? Um, and I'm arguing that uh, in the wake of the uh, war on Donbas, uh, rejection of Russia, uh, has become, uh, in a way, raison d'etat for the Poroshenko government and decommunization as Russia is understood as a successor state of the Soviet Union and inheriting, um, uh, inheriting in itself the whole Eurasian, Eurasian idea. It's uh, presented as rejection of Russia and 
that by itself per se means European integration. And uh, I mean, this is not a Ukrainian phenomenon, and Nor Norman Davis was talking about it and said that in Europe we have seen many times that it, it, become, it became a political football when countries try to uh, detach themselves from their neighbors to, or to go towards the West or go, go more towards uh, Europe. And uh, as I talked about, the attitudes also the po in population changed against uh, Russia. Um, and uh, next thing to go quickly um, about it, next thing I will be discussing is another point here, uh, why uh, this is why the government is doing this, I'm trying to explain. However, I'm also in my paper discussing who is left out of the process. And throughout my interviews, I had a, um, I had feeling that uh, most of, maybe it's because it's very hard to get the data at this point when countries at the war, or there are sentiments that are influenced by the fact that countries at the war. However, when I was asking whether this would uh, antagonize Donbass more, I, would get in, I was getting a response, well, then what can we do about it? Um, so sometimes Ukrainians view of oh, Donbass as hopelessly Sovietized. Uh, it's not real Ukrainian. Uh, and if you look at the polls, actually, and we compare the attitudes on Donbass and in Western Ukraine, you see that Own and UPA uh, have uh, are the most disliked parts of the Ukrainian history for Eastern Ukrainians. And the negatively assessed persons, if you go through the list, you see uh, first you see Bandera, then you see Yushchenko, and then you see Poroshenko. That's the hierarchy for, <laughs> for Eastern Ukraine. Um, so, uh, despite the fact that, uh, gov well, given that the government is not doing actual much change and same time tries to uh, define itself outside Russia, it also leaves out important part of the country that uh, right now might not seem important, but years to pass can uh, become a cornerstone for, you know, in, in a way uh, that we are might the Ukrainian identity clash in future. However, I'm not going into discussing that in my paper. Uh, and I'm going to move to conclusions quickly, and my conclusions is that decommunization, as given by the package, as they call it, package of laws, does not really have any value uh, unless the government uh, offers something extra. It does not include frustration. It, uh, it does not include any changes. I mean, it doesn't even, uh, because it only refers to the historical memory part of it. And so the question, and to answer to my research question, uh, my conclusion is that government needs it to legitimize itself to come up with a new discourse after Maidan because there is a identity uh, there is a space to be filled um, and it's more rhetoric rather than real change and it's an escapism uh, for the government that has not provide that has not really done much for the while the population really demands real change and Christ, um, Yaroslav Hristak famous or uh, prominent Ukrainian historian uh, in his article once says it's yes we Lenin has fallen we don't live on Lenin Street anymore and it's pleasing however what is offered to us uh, historical memory and uh, I would conclude with uh, the quote from Tim Snyder uh, where he says that I worry a little uh, between states past memory laws or decommunization laws what is going and uh, what is it's going into wrong direction uh, because culture is not the problem in Ukraine. Administration is problem in Ukraine, and the state has uh, uh, has a difficult task ahead, a task it can't avoid, which is anti-corruption, anti-oligarchy, and the creation of functioning bureau bureaucracy and rule of law. Uh, and furthermore, one is one famous, not so famous Ukrainian TV show said, uh, a government could remain the modern Moscow Bridge in Kiev as not Moscow Bridge, expressing uh, how little government actually has to offer. Thank you. I can expect my uh, questions. You. Questions? Too much. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, there was a very interesting and enlightening, but uh, can you comment on the fact that this appeal to the past it seems like a mirror image of what is going on in Russia. You know, when they talk about the war all the time, you know, Second World War and uh, past laws prohibiting denial of the official version of the war. And do, do you think there is an influence or is this like something inevitable <laughs> that applies uh, to countries who don't have a very well, it's productive I, institutions. 
I mean, I can't really say how, I mean, I have not studied how it's in Russia. However, for Ukraine's case, what I'm looking at, obviously, countries at the war, and it needs to somehow bring back, and when I'm discussing in my papers, I'm saying that Ukraine, in a way, getting, uh, Andrew Wilson put it really well, getting one's history wrong is most of the time's case for nations. This is not something Ukraine, only Ukraine is doing. Yeah, it's uh, pretty much everywhere that we see that most of the countries, like, see their history in a, in a way that, you know, the getting, it's being part of nation, part of being nation, or, uh, correctly. So, and especially now in Ukraine, when you see the war going on, obviously they do need to bring uh, back the idea of for fighting for independence and so on. Uh, and, and that has become, in a way, the only bread the government is giving to the to public. While public, despite the war going on Donbas, is, requ is requiring or asking for getting something back. So I don't know if I'm replying to your question, but uh, I can't really speak about Russia. I can just say that it, it is most of the times part of being a nation to get its history in a wrong way. So. Uh, so, decommunization is kind of a negative process, right? It's, it's discarding or disowning some parts of the past. Do you see a counter process of looking for usable pieces of history, looking for things that could be a more positive basis for what we do want to be like in the future? Maybe something that would be connected to being more of an honest or rule of law state, even with that? Uh, among the government or among the population? Uh, I mean, yes. Uh, when it comes to the Soviet past, given what the laws say, it's complete rejection of the system uh, in 70 years altogether. However, uh, when government speaks about it, yes, obviously it speaks about Ukraine as Euro in its European future, in its democratic, where you have no corruption and you can reform the institution and so on. However, is it delivery? No. And uh, what we see when uh, people are asked among those who participated in Maidan why they took part in Maidan, most of them uh, say that you know because of the system is not functional, because they are fed up, because the economic situation is going down, and now economic situation has even worsened. So uh, people are waiting to see change. However, they don't see anything going forward. So I would say my conclusion is that this is actually a I mean, it's very early, I'm also pointing out this is early to say, but I'm kind of uh, pointing towards the fact that this might be a missed opportunity of critical juncture and cornerstone mm -hmm. of my paper rather than, yeah. Thank you. So uh, in the first place, uh, one short comment. I really kind of like welcome and salute the conclusion of, of uh, the Snyder quote was really very apt and it is confirmed by experience of uh, my country and the Baltic states in the late 80s, early 90s, kind of this Lenin apart was happening very extensively, both in Georgia and uh, on the Baltic states, on the same level. Although Stalin is a separate story in Georgia, so it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about it. Well, so even though, and kind of this like decommunization, um, uh, so taking down the communist symbols was happening almost on the same level, the path that the Baltic states and the uh, Georgia made in the 90s and early 2000s was very different, notwithstanding kind of kind of symbolic um, equality. So symbolism is important. It is like part of actually getting rid of history, but it's maybe necessary, but not sufficient. And like Snyder put it very well, it's like nice that we put it in. Um, the second sort of a little bit devil's advocate question, talking about the uh, criminal nature of Soviet regime, which I like, well, I, with, I like totally embrace. Are there any voices in Ukraine which say, maybe a little bit cynically, maybe a little bit like to counter this narrative, that thanks to this uh, criminal nature of Soviet regime, Ukraine got the borders that they have, for instance, like Crimea, given by Khrushchev, or <laughs> the Bukovina, which Chernivtsi uh, snatched from Romania as a, as a result of ultimatum, Lviv itself being part of Poland before that. So are they? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this is like, uh, this is something that like, uh, obviously Ukrainians would not agree with you about. <laughs> what they are still saying, like what I've heard from the critics of the bad part of the legislation when it comes to the uh, criminal nature is that it's, uh, and important part, good you asked this, that question, is that because Ukraine also prohibited the Communist Party. And then the, now the Communist Party, there are three Communist parties. One is Workers and Peasants Party, and there is another com new Communist Party and Communist Party. And one of them appealed to the European Court of Justice, uh, European Human Rights Court. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and they are 
and they might win it because uh, the idea and the critics of this law and that many say that this prohibits freedom like goes against the freedom of speech because we should be able to say whatever we would like about the period of the history we lived in. So, um, I mean, I don't As of Georgia and Baltics, we can discuss that separately. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yes. Yeah, I just had a quick question. The numbers that you quoted earlier are about 30% um, positive view of Russia in May of 2015, does that include the Donbass or this was just the other part of Ukraine? Uh, I, I think it includes Donbass only, not Crimea. Oh, wait, no. Not, uh, it does not include Crimea, I but it includes Donbass. So 30% in the Donbass area have a negative view of uh, uh, have a positive view of no, Russia. It's nationwide. Mm -hmm. Nationwide. Right. Yeah, 88. It was previously mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. But so that includes Donbass. Donbass only. How can they go? Yeah. They go through. Um, I had a question about the uh, nature of. Uh, you might have discussed this, and um, I, I might not have caught it, but the um, nature of the of pluralism in the political discourse of memory. Uh, the heroes they're holding out uh, in most of Ukraine uh, from the freedom fighters uh, were ethnic Ukrainians often committing atrocities against non-ethnic Ukrainians. Um, is there a recognition that Ukraine's history uh, more so even than that of many other countries which have similarly m pluralistic and multi-ethnic history. Um, is there a recognition that, um, uh, that there are many different peoples who have always lived there, that there are, um, that really Ukraine owes its, um, its nationhood to, to many different ethnicities? Or is, is it a very, mm. is this a very, the, particularly the decommunization legislation, is it a very uh, ethnocentric? Uh, yeah. Well, it's very hard, in a way, to know. One thing, one thing is, it's the literature I've been reviewing. Most of the people say that Ukraine is now embracing the civic identity rather than ethnic, and first time in history, so on. Very hard to rely on them. Uh, however, when you come down to the Western Ukrainian history and you come, or, or the history of the freedom fighters, and when I inquired through my interviews. Tim Snyder calls these people very you know, anti-Semite. Like, and you are. What do you think about? It? They would always say, you know, "Well, you know, it was war." What? So it was war. All the parties, you know, we are bad. So yes, we do know that there have been some atrocities, etc. But it was part of the war. Uh, how much? I think. Uh, I think Ukrainians now really what you see in uh, current debates and politics, Ukraine is becoming more inclusive. If you look at the different, I mean, I'm not talking about Georgians, but people like some from other ethnicities being players in the politics and so on. However, when it comes to history, it's, it, that's what they say. It was part of the war. Every single, probably, person I've interviewed, and I had 20 interviews said that, well, you know, what time, what you can say. Anyone else? If not, thank you very much.